Howdy. We're going to pick up where we left off in the last video, and we're going to keep talking about information that we're able to get from an X-ray diffraction spectra. Uh, before, we were focusing primarily on peak position, so where we see uh, diffraction peaks, what, uh, at what particular scattering angle. But today, what we're going to focus on is peak intensity. Uh, so what is the total number of counts that I, um, I count at my detector that's associated with a particular peak? Um, and as a reminder, peak intensity can give you information about the contents uh, within a unit cell. So where are individual atoms? Uh, how are atoms ranged, uh, arranged with respect to each other? Um, so that tells you something about molecular structure. Um, are atoms on particular sub-lattices, or are they randomly distributed? That could tell you something about atomic ordering. Um, and it also gives you something, some information about the microstructure of material. So our individual grains, are they randomly oriented or do they tend to be aligned in a particular direction? So the, the intensity of the peak, um, it's important to understand that we don't usually use the maximum counts at the detector as a measure of the intensity. Instead, basically we're integrating the area under a particular peak. So this is what I'm calling a peak. Uh, this dashed dot line is the background, um, and so the intensity of this peak is basically taken by um, calculating the difference between um, the measured point and the calculated background, and integrating it, or numerically summing it up, uh, over uh, the entire width of the peak. Um, so uh, numerically, um, you would count that uh, this way. And so each of these data points is a different data point that's measured at the detector, um, a very small, uh, with very small angular steps from one point to the next point. So the big point here is that the intensity is the integrated area underneath a peak. So uh, what affects peak intensity? Uh, well, uh, this does. So it's a very long expression with a lot of terms, and we're going to go through these terms one by one. Um, but these are things that add up and affect the intensity of a particular peak. And remember, each peak is associated with one plane, so one family of HKL planes. So HKL is the indexes, the indices of that family of planes. Um, so this first thing, K, K is just a scaling factor. Uh, and the scaling factor takes into account a whole bunch of things. It's kind of a catch-all term. Um, takes into account the particular uh, setup that you have. So how bright is your x-ray source? How many x-rays are coming out? Um, how many uh, x-rays are you letting through initial slits to hit your sample? How many different slits are you having to, um, to, to scan out uh, and, and um, remove noise or scattered x-rays? Um, so all of these things affect the intensity at a particular point. So let's say I had a, a much brighter source or I, I had a higher current, I'm generating more x-rays. Um, that would increase the intensity of every single peak that I see, and so that would, um, that would go into this scaling factor. Other things that affect the scale factor are um, what, uh, what um, the material is that's diffracting. Um, so uh, different elements diffract differently. And as example, copper and gold, they have the same exact um, crystal structure. Uh, so they both would have an FCC structure. They both have a 100 family of planes. Uh, however, um, gold has a lot higher electron density, and so gold will diffract um, X-rays uh, more strongly than copper will. And so gold would result in a higher intensity of peaks, and that goes into this scale factor as well. In general, um, this the the ability of an electron to scatter X-rays. Uh, is directly related to uh, the number of electrons it has around its, uh, its outer shell. And that's because, remember, X-rays are electromagnetic magnetic radiation. They're coming in, they're vibrating, they're exciting electrons, and they're, um, uh, they're re-emitting uh, X-rays in all different directions. And the ability to do that is strongly correlated with the number of electrons in the system. Um, so atomic scattering factors, they increase with the atomic number or the number of electrons in the system. Um, and they're also a function of um, the, uh, the diffraction angle that you're measuring. So sine theta over lambda, where lambda is the wavelength uh, of the uh, X-ray radiation. Um, so as a quick test, which of these ions is going to have the strongest scattering factor? 
Is it uh, metallic iron, iron 2 plus, or iron 3 plus? Um, remember, uh, the thing that scatters x-rays is the electron cloud surrounding uh, the atom. Um, iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus um, have fewer electrons, and so a neutral iron is going to have a stronger, a larger scattering factor because it has a larger electron cloud surrounding it. Um, uh, so so uh, the scaling factor uh, is also um, uh, going to take into account if I have multiple phases in the system. Um, so if I have a material that's all one phase or if it's a mixture of different things, um, each of those uh, phases would have a, a volume fraction uh, of, the, of the phase present, and that would be lumped into this scaling factor as well. So that's all the first term. <laughs> so we got a number of terms left to go. PHKL is the multiplicity factor. Um, and, and, and here we're talking about the multiplicity of uh, planes, uh, particularly how many planes have the same D spacing. And so one way to think about that is, you know, remember your reciprocal lattice is set up so that the distance from the origin of the reciprocal lattice to a particular point is inversely proportional to the D spacing. So how many points exist some distance away from the origin? Um, and if we consider, for example, an orthorhombic crystal, and this is a 2D orthorhombic reciprocal lattice, um, uh, indices like H00, 0K0, 00L, these each have a multiplicity of two. Um, and the H00 point uh, would be the point at our A star here and here. So there are two points um, that particular uh, distance away from the origin of the reciprocal lattice. So there are two points that have that D spacing. Um, if I think about HK0, um, well, that would be like, uh, you know, uh, the one, uh, the one, one, zero. Um, and, and I have, I actually have four reciprocal lattice points that are the same distance um, from the origin. And so in this HK0 family, um, the multiplicity is higher. There are four equivalent points in the reciprocal lattice. Um, I think here we're going to walk through that same example. So HOO, there's two equivalent points. Let's say you're thinking about the 2OO plane, the 2OO and the, the bar 2OO. Um, but for something like the 2OO, uh, we have four equivalent points. And so the multiplicity is higher. And really all that's saying is that there are a larger potential number of planes to diffract radiation. Uh, and so the intensity of diffraction radiation is going to scale with that multiplicity. Um, so let's think about the multiplicity in a tetragonal unit cell. In a tetragonal unit cell, remember all the angles are right angles. A equals B does not equal C. So C is the unique axis. Uh, and what that means is the distance from uh, zero uh, to um, the 100 point uh, on the reciprocal lattice is the same as the distance from the zero to the 200 point. Uh, I'm sorry, to, to the zero one zero point. Um, and so another way to say that is the D spacing of the 100 family of planes, which is what this reciprocal last point represents, is equal to the D spacing of the 200 uh, family of planes, which is uh, what this lattice point represents. And so if we're asking what is the multiplicity uh, of H00, um, in this case, uh, H00, uh, these all have the same multiplicity. So the distance from the, the origin um, to these four points on the reciprocal lattice is all the same. Um, and that's because there's this fourfold rotational axis uh, in the tetragonal unit cell. I ignore the orthorhombic state down here. Um, so the multiplicity is higher in this case than it was in the orthorhombic case because of this symmetry constraint, because the uh, a star distance equals the B star distance. Okay, so again, P sub HKL is just the multiplicity uh, factor. How many planes do I have to diffract in a certain um, direction? Um, the, the total amount of um, diffracted radiation is, is essentially conserved. And so one other way to think about this, um, again, I have an orthorhombic crystal here. Um, and let's treat this bottom one as a tetragonal crystal. So the U1 and U2 um, principal lattice vectors are the same length. 
And if that's the case, then these H00 and 0K0 planes basically are all uh, sitting at the same spacing. And so whereas before in the orthorhombic case, I had two distinct peaks, each of which are at slightly different two theta angles because the HOO and the OKO um, spacings are different. Uh, if I'm looking at the tetragonal crystal, those two peaks have come together, they're overlapping. And so I have a greater total intensity, but I have a smaller number of peaks. Um, so again, this is multiplicity factor is how many um, planes do I have uh, that have that particular D spacing. Um, these next two terms are basically um, things that are associated with the geometry of your particular detector. Um, they're referred to as the Lorentz multiplier factor, the polarization factor, and they have to deal with, um, if we have radiation coming in a particular direction, um, the, the diffracted intensity uh, depends on things like the takeoff angle. Um, and that is particularly true if that radiation is polarized. And it, and it turns out that in a lot of diffractometers, we introduce um, certain elements to clean up our beam, which result in some polarization. Um, so these are geometric things. They're things that um, affect the intensity in very uh, sort of known um, known and standard ways. So they're basically things that you can account for if you know something about the particular instrument you're using. Um, they're not really things that are dependent on the material you're looking at um, at all. And so these are things that usually, if we look at a standard known material, we're able to account for and remove for other unknown materials we want to look at. Uh, so this next thing uh, is the absorption multiplier. Um, so uh, X-ray radiation, it's diffracted, but it also is going to get um, absorbed as it, as it passes through a material. And every material has a different absorption length, uh, and that absorption um, length is basically how, uh, a distance. How far does, uh, does the radiation go before it's, uh, it's absorbed by a set amount, by 50% or 95%? Um, so these, these absorption coefficients, they depend on the material you're looking at, and they also depend on, on the wavelength. So for a particular material, um, materials tend to absorb very strongly at you know, um, wavelengths that are associated with uh, absorption edges uh, within their electronic spectrum or uh, structure. Um, so the reason we need to take it, this into account is that this absorption, the, the path length that the X-ray follows um, uh, after it's come in and has been diffracted and is uh, detected by the scattered beam, that path length is very dependent on the angle uh, that I'm measuring at. And so some um, HKL planes that we're looking at are at very low angles, some are at higher angles. And so again, if, if there's any uh, factor that is um, the intensity is dependent on the angle of your spectrometer, um, we need to uh, basically take that into account. Um, so this is another thing that is, you know, it, it does depend on the material somewhat because it depends on these, um, uh, sorry, it depends on the absorption coefficient of the material, it depends on the particular um, wavelength that, that our, your spectrometer is using. Um, but again, they're things that vary with pretty known relationships uh, as this angle of measurement uh, changes. Um, and so here, here that term is the absorption. Uh, it's basically proportional to, uh, this is a question where mu uh, effective is that um, effective uh, 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 absorption coefficient and sine of thing, theta is the measurement angle. Um, so this next term is something that is, is quite important uh, in a lot of cases. Um, and it's kind of coming back to this question again of, are we looking at a single crystal? Are lo we looking at a handful of crystals? Or are we looking at many, many, many different crystals? Um, and so, you know, when we're thinking about diffraction to begin with, a single crystal, um, you have uh, diffraction spots only at very particular points of the detector. And those points are defined as when the avald sphere um, intersects with the reciprocal lattice. Um, so, so those, that if we have a single crystal, we expect to see a pattern where we have a bunch of spots where 
these spots are basically observations of that reciprocal lattice itself. Um, things get more complicated as you have a large number of crystals that overlap. So if you do a thought experiment, if you think about having two crystals at slightly different orientations, well, you could have this speckle pattern, and you could have a second speckle pattern that is just rotated a little bit with respect to that first speckle pattern. Um, in reality, a lot of the samples we look at have things on the order of 100 to 1,000 crystals. Um, and so what you start to see is there starts being uh, uh, this, this circular line here where we see a whole bunch of bright spots along that line. And so each of those bright spots is referring usually back to a single crystal that's aligned just right so that we have a, a, a diffraction condition in, in that particular position. Um, now, if we scale up to a, 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 a true powder, powder, and a powder is something where we're looking at, you know, at least tens of thousands of, of crystals, if not hundred thousands or millions of crystals. Um, if I have a powder and I have so many different grains, then then I'm I'm equal. I'm I'm basically finally I'm likely to see. Um, a grain oriented in the particular orientation that I need to get diffraction um, at that orientation. And so what has happened is as I've gone to a powder, um, I, I see a uniform distribution of crystals um, and, and these lines, these circles that we see, they're, they're the, the intersection again of this, um, this reciprocal as, but it's free to rotate and spin around in space. And so, so diffraction uh, radiation um, you can think about it as coming out in cones. Um, and so these circles are the intersection of the cone um, and the detector itself. Um, so where am I going with this? Well, this bottom image is the case for when those all of those crystals are randomly oriented. But if we're looking at a solid polycrystalline material, based on how I made that, in many cases, they're not really randomly oriented. Um, and a perfect example would be if I'm looking at a metal that I've just machined. Maybe I've, I've um, lathed it, so I've, I've done some machining process to remove material. Maybe it's been through rollers, so it's, uh, it's been plastically deformed. Um, in all of these cases, all of these processes have, tend to have some impact on the orientation of crystals in the material. And if that's the case, I don't see this uniform diffraction radiation anymore. Instead, I would tend to see something that, you know, it would start off looking like this, but um, I would have statistically more orientation, uh, uh, more intensity in particular orientations. And again, that's just due to the particular manufacturing process that, that uh, resulted in that texture. Um, so this is an example of that. And so this is basically um, a, a subsection, you know, a sub image of this overall pattern, you know, picture just taking a rectangle uh, like this and looking at the diffraction radiation in, inside of it. And instead of, the thing to look at is instead of continuous lines, um, we have these bright streaks and then they fade away. Um, and in some cases we see very little uh, diffracted radiation um, associated with the spot, except it gets brighter a little bit here on the edge. Um, and so these are all, uh, these are all resulting from the fact that statistically, I just happen to have more grains that are aligned in a particular direction. And this is what we talk about, or what we mean when we refer to uh, texture or, or preferred orientation. Um, the fact that statistically, it might be the case that not all of the, um, the planes that are responsible for diffraction uh, are randomly oriented. Instead, I might have more oriented in some particular directions rather than others. And that would mean that based on how I've oriented the sample when I'm collecting the spectra, um, I could have brighter or, or weaker um, diffraction um, it, uh, for those particular planes. Um, and, and this is just kind of um, a, a picture to give you a result. We're going to talk about um, texture later on in class. If I start off with a, a material that's kind of randomly polycrystalline, and then let's say I cold roll it, that, that means I take the whole material, um, I send it through rollers, so I'm deforming it. It's basically smushing the material. It's going from a, a, a thick slab into a thinner sheet. Um, then what I tend to do is smear grains out, and, and um, it tends to rotate uh, grain orientation. And so whereas before I had things that were randomly aligned, now I tend to have certain grains are lining up, uh, let's say, uh, um, with a, a particular HKL family of planes, 
um, parallel to the surface of that sample. And that's going to affect the intensity of the diffraction peak um, for that particular uh, peak. Um, e, uh, e HKL, this is the extinction multiplier. This is, is basically um, taking into account the fact that crystals are not perfect. So even within a crystal, uh, there tends to be um, some kind of disorder. Um, this, is, this is not a, uh, a strong effect in a lot of cases. This is something that primarily crops up when we're talking about single crystals. Um, so we're not, we're not going to talk too much about the extinction multiplier. Um, however, this final term is also a very important term to understand. Uh, and uh, FHKL is called the structure factor or the structure amplitude. So let's dig into that a little bit more. And what we're going to do is we're going to start off by thinking about um, a thought experiment. So this is the diffraction condition that we drew before. Um, and so let's say I have a, a plane of atoms here and a plane of atoms here uh, with a D spacing. Um, and so this is a, this is a primitive lattice. Um, so maybe this is a simple cubic lattice, for example. Um, and, and let's say that this D spacing is such that for a particular wavelength of radiation, um, I see a diffraction peak at this theta angle. And remember, that's because the diffracted radiation that comes through, the path length, the extra path length, this d sine theta um, on one inch, and then another d sine theta here, so it adds up to 2d sine theta, that extra path length is equal to an integral number of wavelengths. And so at the end of the day, uh, my out, the, the diffracted radiation adds up constructively. So I see a peak of one wave, um, aligning with a peak of another. That means the wavelengths, uh, uh, the coherent radiation is interacting constructively. It's adding up, and I'm going to see a diffraction spot at that particular angle. So this is what we've talked about before. But let's think about what happens if I add an extra plane of atoms. And I'm adding this at halfway uh, through this despacing. Um, and this is basically what a body-centered lattice is, right? I have um, I have a lattice point on each of the corners, and then I have a lattice point right in the, uh, the middle of the unit cell. Um, so what happens here? Because basically I've just added a new plane of atoms that I need to account for. Um, and so I can think about another ray that's coming in. Again, it's coming in coherently. Uh, it's coming out, but you know now this extra path length is not exactly n lambda. It's, it's half of that because the positioning is half of the despacing. And so whereas before the other ones lined up constructively, now this one is lining up destructively. So the, the valley of one of these uh, 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 waves of uh, extra radiation is lining up with the peak in another wave. And that means that if I add this together, they cancel out. And so in this particular structure, um, for the 100 family of planes, um, uh, whereas usually I would expect to see a peak at this particular angle, now I don't. And I don't because of uh, where the atoms were sitting within the unit cell. Um, so the, the net, the takeaway from this is that the position of atoms within the unit cell matters. And the kind of atom, the flavor that is sitting on a particular plane matters as well. So let's say I, instead of... Um, the atoms at these positions and at the center, if, if they're not the same kind of atom, let's say this is a different kind of atom. So this would be um, like a cesium chloride is a, is a cubic body-centered structure. Um, so if it's a different kind of atom, then the, the, uh, uh, the X-ray scattering cross-section of that atom um, might be a little bit less. And so now, even though the wavelengths are um, sort of anti-aligned, they are not of the same intensity, and so they don't, they don't totally cancel out. I would have a weaker diffraction peak, um, but it doesn't cancel out to zero. And so the main takeaway from, from this uh, little lesson is that not just the position, but the flavor of atoms matter. How strongly each particular atom is able to scatter radiation um, matters. Um, so structure factor, again, it depends not just on the lattice itself, but where are atoms sitting within the lattice. Um, the structure factor can be calculated. Uh, it's a little bit beyond the objectives of this class, so I don't think we're going to go there. Um, but, you know, it depends on how many atoms 
are in the unit cell. So basically I'm adding up um, some contribution from each atom. Uh, it depends on the uh, particular angle of a, of a family of planes. So it would be different uh, for a, uh, you know, uh, one index plane and another index plane. It depends on which sites are occupied or empty. It depends on how much things vibrate. It depends on a whole bunch of things. Um, and at the end of the day, what you can do is if you, um, you know, if you sort of have some idea about where those atoms are sitting, um, you can calculate a structure factor for a particular plane. Um, and again, it depends on this interaction between the plane and then these XYJ, uh, uh, XYZ terms. And these XYZ terms are referring to where different atoms are sitting um, within that unit cell. Um, so if we go back to the example we just thought about, in some cases, uh, the structure factor will go to zero. And, and what that means is that uh, that particular plane uh, is called a forbidden reflection, whereas you would usually see a peak associated with that, with that despacing because the atoms are in just the right positions, they kind of cancel each other out and there's no peak observed. And so the example, the thought experiment we worked through is the BCC structure, um, and we don't see a 100 uh, plane uh, because the um, the half spacing in between sort of canceled that out. Um, however, we do see a two zero zero plane, um, and that would be very different from the simple cubic. So in the simple cubic, uh, we see both a one zero zero and a two zero zero plane. So for certain structures, this is the face centered cubic, the body centered cubic, the diamond cubic. Um, there are conditions in which uh, you would expect to see a diffraction peak, but you don't see anything. And these are called forbidden reflections. Um, and uh, this is uh, not something that uh, I want you to go home and memorize, but basically depending on the, on the Brave lattice, um, if we think about a primitive lattice versus a body-centered, a face-centered, um, and these are all A, B, C-centered, a whole bunch of different kind of lattice, they place restrictions on um, which HKL planes you would expect to be able to see. Um, and so one example is that uh, in a primitive cubic lattice, you would expect to see the 100 zero, zero planes. In the body-centered uh, cubic lattice, so that's represented by the I here, if I put in 100, zero, zero, I get an odd number, but it's only an allowed fraction I uh, reflection if, if H plus K plus L is even. And so this is, this is just sort of a condensed way to note um, that the 100 zero, zero, uh, is a forbidden reflection. In fact, any in indexes, uh, indexed planes that um, uh, H plus K plus L add up to an odd number, I would not see that particular peak in the, BC, in the, in the BCC, uh, the body-centered structure. Uh, this is not just for body-centered cubic, this is for all body-centered structures. Um, so what does this look like? Um, let's think about uh, diffraction patterns for three lattices that have exactly the same lattice parameter. So maybe the edge of this cube is five angstroms. In the simple cubic lattice, you would see um, all of the uh, diffraction peaks associated with these spacings um, that would fall um, within some two theta range. Um, the FCC and the BCC both have particular sets of forbidden um, reflections. And so there are spots where, again, you would originally you would expect to see a plane, but you don't um, because the structure factor for uh, 110, for example, in FCC goes to zero. Uh, 